Good morning, everyone. Yeah, hey, whether you're in the room or you're watching online, we're so glad that you are joining us and participating with us to celebrate that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And I don't know about you, but I think that's really good news. I think it's really good news that Jesus has been raised from the dead because that means that, that you and that I, we get to follow Jesus in that if we'll make him king of our life. Amen? Amen. Hey, so for those of us who are in the room real quick uh, and online, I also want to say this to you. Uh, if, you're, if you're new with us, maybe your first or second time, and, and you'd like to connect uh, or let us know that you're here, we would love that. Here's how you can do it. Just text the word NEXT to the number 474747. Four, seven. Go ahead and do it. That'll just quick, hit you a quick form. Let us know that you were here, you, you were participating with us in some way, and I'll reach out to you this week. I'd love to do that. Uh, maybe even send you a free gift if you, you know, play cards right. Uh, also, if you're here in the room, a couple of reminders. If you're not on the stage, please make sure to keep a mask on and over your face. That just helps everybody in the room to feel more comfortable. We're not out of this pandemic yet, uh, but the more we practice social distancing and do what we're supposed to do and abiding by CDC guidelines, the faster I think we'll get out. Also, if you're in the room, if you need a restroom this morning, straight behind you, they're back there. There's also a kids area back there if you have um, some children's with you and they start getting the wiggles. Uh, but here in a moment, uh, we are about to sing it out. Okay, are you ready to sing it out? Here in a moment, we're going to sing it out. We're going to get loud. I want to invite you to feel free in this place to worship. Uh, but would you stand with me now? We're going to pray together. Go ahead and stand with me now. We're at, even at home. Let's pray together, and we're going to get started. Lord, we thank you for today. We know that it's only by your grace that it's possible for us to be here and to stand here and to worship you. I pray for a blessing over our time together that what we do here would change our lives and would change our communities, would change this world in your name. And together, everybody said, amen. Let's sing. Step out of the shadows, step out of the grave, break into the wild, and don't be afraid, run into wide open spaces, grace is waiting for you, dance like the weight has been lifted, grace is Waiting. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Come out of the dark, just as you are, into the fullness of His love. For the Spirit is here, let there be free. all of the burdens, bring all of the scars, come back to communion, come back to the sky, we'll run into wide open spaces, graces waiting for you, dance like the weight has been lifted, graces Waiting where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom, there is freedom Where the Spirit of the Lord is There is freedom, there is freedom Come out of the dark, just as you are Into the fullness of His love For the Spirit is here
Old friend, prison shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Life's made home, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. With chains will fall, prison shake at the sound of Jesus' name. Life's made home, hearts awake at the sound of Jesus' name. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Come out in the dark, just as you are, into the fullness of His love. For the Spirit is here, let them be free. I am a child of love. 
I found a world of freedom. I found a friend in Jesus. I am a child of love. Yeah. and message is so good. If you'd like, you can have a seat for a few minutes. In the book of Acts, um, we read that as Paul is traveling back to Jerusalem, he stops in to see some friends, some leaders from the church of Ephesus. He stops near Ephesus and he calls those folks to be with him because he wants to say goodbye to them. These are church leaders, these are friends, these are folks who he probably led into the faith when he was at Ephesus before. And as Paul is saying this emotional goodbye, he shares some words from Jesus that we don't have recorded anywhere else in the New Testament, but Luke records them here. Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. That truth is at the heart of the Christian life. It is a blessing to see how our giving helps someone live the dream of knowing God. There are four ways that you can give to Church on the Drive. You can give through your online banking. You can text an amount to 407-863-6797. You can give through the church's website, churchonthedrive.org, and just click Give. Or if you're here in person today, you can give as you exit. Every dime that we give goes toward helping people live the dream of knowing God. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have an opportunity to watch a video of some young people who are living that dream in part because of your faithful giving. Let's pray. Father, we praise and glorify you. We thank you for your amazing love. It's because of your great and reckless love for us that we give gladly and generously, that others may know that love too. Amen. Right, I'm Sheree Jefferson. I'm 19. I go to Charleston Southern University, and I'm a freshman in college. My name is Charquez Spain, and I'm 20. My name is Christopher Henry. I'm 15 years old and I'm in 10th grade at Edgewater High School. I accepted Jesus when I was young. My grandparents, you know, they used to take me to the church with them. You know, I've never really understood, but while I was growing up, it was coming clear. God is first. My grandmother always been like, spiritual soul was like always been like around God. And I was always curious and like asked questions about God and stuff. So it's like, I, I accepted them, but it's like, I didn't take the full step until today. I accepted Jesus as my savior, like when I was younger, you know, I went, always went to a Christian school. You know, my, my, my grandparents are pastors. I always grew up going to church with them. You know, I knew a lot about God and stuff. So yeah, I always accepted him like, as my savior. He impacted my life. I used, to, I used to get in like a lot of trouble. You know, I used to always be a bad child, but, um, I started going back going to church and, you know, got my life together with Jesus. You know, Jesus impacted my life. He took me out of bad situations for the better of myself. You know, without him, I'd either be in jail or in the grave. But thank God. Because no matter how hard things got and I wanted to shut down, I just know God never gave up on me and he just kept me fighting. And when stuff got tough, he pushed me and motivated me and gave me light when I didn't have it. I chose to be baptized because I want to live to Christ. I've chosen to be baptized because I feel like this is a better way to further my life with Christ and live by God and be a better man. Um, I chose to be baptized. I want to put, make Jesus my savior like the official way. My favorite Bible verse is I who can do all things to Christ that strengthens me is because like it helped me realize that if I stay humble to God and myself and put my mind to it, I can conquer anything. My favorite Bible verse is Matthew 19, 26. 
Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. This is my favorite verse because like, it really it really strives me the most. With, with God, you can do anything, but you know, with man, you know, might, not everything is impossible, but you know, with God, it's the right way, and that's, you know, he makes everything possible. My favorite Bible verse is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 through 24. And it says, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupted through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. And to me, that just means change for the better. I like, I like to thank my mother. You know, she she really proud of me, like making Jesus my own um, savior of my life. And I like, thank my friends for like, you know, talking with me about it, you know, and helping me through the way. And I also like to thank Pastor Josh for giving me this opportunity, you know, to make Jesus my the savior of my life. I like to thank my loved ones, my family, my friends, my coaches, Pastor Josh. I would like to thank my grandma, Salisa Manning, uh, Pastor Josh, Coach Duke, uh, and the whole Edgewater coaching staff in general for like molding me into the man I am today to make this decision. I'm here to say publicly that Jesus is king of my life. Sorry, guys, I want to ask you the same question. Are you ready from this day forward for everybody to know that Jesus is king of your life? Yes. Well, then according to your faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dead to sin, and raised to new life in Jesus. Oh yeah! I'm here to say that publicly that Jesus is the king of my life. Ray, have you made Jesus king of your life? Yes. All right, come on this way. Down to right here. Well, Ray, in accordance with your faith, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is it. Ray, the new life. Right! I am here today to publicly profess that Jesus is the savior of my life. Are you ready from this day forward for everybody to know that Jesus is king of your life? When I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, dead to sin, raised to new life in Jesus. You have 
have been so, so good to me When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me You have been so, so kind to me And oh, the overwhelming never
And this mountain that's in front of me Will be thrown into the midst of the sea And through it all, through it all My eyes are on you And through it all, through it all i
Well, we are in part three of our new series we're calling Living the Dream, where we're trying to answer this question. What would it look like to live our best possible life? What would it look like for you to live your best possible life? What would it look like for me to live my best possible life? A, a couple of weeks ago on Easter, we said, look, it just stands to reason that if you were created to do something, then you should be doing that thing in order to live your best possible life. Well, it turns out you and I were created to know God. So the, one of the ways we can live our best possible life is to know God. And Jesus made a way for us to do that. You saw an example of some of these guys who have found that in Jesus, that they are going to be uh, following Jesus. They came to know God, but not just to know God, right? We want to enjoy God. We learned last week that we need to be enjoying God, not just knowing Him. But if we want to live our best possible life, we'll know God. And if we never uh, enjoy God, we'll never fully enjoy life. One of the ways we, we begin to enjoy life is we look at the people around us. We enjoy the people around us. We enjoy um, God's creation around us. What we found out is uh, God is the ultimate source uh, of all joy, that all things we enjoy, all of reality, springs out of the person who is God. And so if there is anything we enjoy in life, that ultimately that joy is coming from God in some way, like light breaking through the darkness. One of the things I enjoy uh, the most, I don't know about you, but I enjoy going to the beach. I love being at the beach and just hanging out there for two or three hours by myself. I usually go in the middle of the week because nobody else is there and I can find some time alone, get off by myself. I have a secluded spot I always go to. I will not share with you where it is. Um, it's my spot. And I like to go there and hang out and just be quiet. And the waves are crashing. It's wonderful. I'm sitting there in my chair. Every year, though, around this time, I start seeing the same group of people show up. They know they're not supposed to be there, but they start showing up. High school seniors. High school seniors. The senioritis has kicked in, and they're like, I'm skipping school. I don't care anymore. I'm just going. I got enough. I can, I can do all of this. And so they start showing up, and, and I'm, you know, a little bit old manish at this point, and I, I just kind of sit there like, you guys need to go to school. Get out of here, right? And they'll, and they'll bring out their little boom boxes and turn on the, the music on the beach, and I'm like, oh, this is the worst. But they're, they're seniors in high school, and they just know. They just know that once they graduate, they're going to be free. So they're trying to get a taste of that freedom now. They want that freedom. They, I had a, one of them tell me the other day, they said, man, I can't wait till after high school. I can't wait. It's going to be, I'm going to have so much more freedom. I said, are you, are you serious? I said, yeah, I won't be near as busy as I am right now. I always got schoolwork. I always got this going on. I got to go to this and that. I, I, I'm going to have so much more time. I said, no, you won't. No, you won't. He goes, yeah, yeah, oh, no. I say, no, you won't. You're going to have this, and then you're going to have this, and you're going to have this. But he, he was convinced, just like a lot of his friends, that he's going to have so much more freedom on the other side of high school graduation. And you probably know high school seniors like this. Maybe you were a high school senior like this. You got, you got done, and you went off to college, and you got there, and you had all this freedom, right? You, you thought, I can do whatever I want. I can stay up as late as I want. I, I'm an adult now. I'm grown. Mom and dad still pay for my car, my cell phone, all my tuition, all my books, all my food. But I'm grown now. now I can do all of these things. I remember the first time I felt like an actual adult when I got off to college. It was about two or three weeks in. I was sitting in my dorm room. I was lay, actually, I was laying down on my bed. And uh, I had my shoes on. This is important to this story. Because growing up in my house, my mom, maybe like your mom, was a little bit persnickety about f shoes being on furniture. It was not allowed. Not allowed at all. And she had this sixth sense. right? She could sense when I was doing this. She'd be outside. No way she could see me in the living room. I'd put my feet up on the couch with my shoes on. I'm hearing it from outside. Take those shoes off the couch. So as I'm sitting there in my dorm room two or three weeks in, I put my shoes up onto my bed without thinking. And the first thought that comes to, mom, to mind is, I better get these off of here or mom is going to like, come in here and yell at me. Then my next thought was, mama ain't here. I can do what I want. So I start doing, like just digging my feet into, the, into that bed. I'm like, yeah, that's right, I'm grown now. That was how exciting I was as a college freshman, right? 
But uh, some freshmen take it a, a little bit further. They, they go a little bit further off and, and, and they start going berserk, right? Because you, a lot of us, we don't know how to handle freedom. When we have it, we don't know what to do with it. And it's not just college students or 20-somethings. I mean, we're talking about people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, still don't know how to use the freedom we've been given. We, we still don't use it well. Let's just look at our health, right? You know, you know that you probably shouldn't be eating cheeseburgers every day. And yet, and yet, you still keep eating a cheeseburger every day just because you can. You know you should be exercising. You should be going on walks, if not runs. And yet, you don't do it. We don't always use our freedom very well, do we? And that's exactly the situation that the churches in Galatia found themselves in in the first century. It's exactly why Paul had to write to them and say, hey, we need, to do the, we need to talk about some stuff. Now, I want to remind you of where Galatia is. Galatia is up here in this section. Jerusalem is down here. Reminder, that's where uh, Jesus uh, died and was resurrected. Just a little bit above that, the Sea of Galilee, that's where Jesus did a lot of his ministry, all in this area. So within 20 years after Jesus' death, there is a significant population of Christians all the way up here. Spreading out over here, significant population of Christians up there. And the reason was because of people like Paul. Paul uh, was an apostle. Paul wasn't always an apostle, though. He had started out as a Pharisee, as many of you know, and all that means is, as a Pharisee, he was a part of this uh, religious group that was dedicated to keeping the law. It was like a Christian fraternity, or a, a Jewish fraternity, for that matter. Um, he, he, had, he said, look, we're going to keep the law as much as we can. Now, what we often forget about with Pharisees, they were actually very mission-oriented. They were a very missional group. In fact, if you go and you look at how many Jews were in different cities throughout the Roman Empire at this time, uh, one of the things you'll find is there were a lot of them. It's because people like the Pharisees sent missionaries all over the Roman Empire. And that's why there were a lot of Jews in places like Rome, in Ephesus, and even the rest of Galatia over here. So when Paul would show up to these places, he, he had an encounter with Jesus. He, he was, uh, he'd come up as a Pharisee. He had uh, trained under the rabbi Gamaliel, and he, was, he had learned a lot of things. He was very smart and was on an upward trajectory. And then he had an encounter with Jesus. He changed the way he was going. Some scholars believe he was going to be one of these pharisaical Jewish missionaries that was going out to win converts to Judaism. But then he had an encounter with, with Jesus, the risen resurrected Jesus and it changed everything for him he had no reason to change he had no reason to change his trajectory at all other than this encounter that changed his mind and Paul a few years after that starts traveling all throughout the Roman Empire specifically through places like Galatia so he gets up into Galatia and he does what he does in every town. He goes to the local synagogue where he knows there will be Jews that kind of speak his language and, and know the theological stuff that he knows. And he'll try to win them over. So he'd go in there and try to win them over. And then after they kicked him out of that synagogue, which they inevitably would, he would go and find everybody else, literally anybody else who would listen to his message. He would go and find them, win them over, and teach them how to follow Jesus. And then he would develop a church and a structure of leadership. And once he got them on solid footing, he would leave and go to the next place. That's exactly what he did with the churches in this area, this region of Galatia. Well, sometime after Paul left, another group of missionaries came in. Now, Paul was a Jewish Christian, so that's why he always started with the Jews and then went to the Gentiles. But in his mind, there was no difference between a Jew or Greek or male or female or slave or free in Christ, right? There was no difference. But he had some Jewish Christian missionaries who had come along behind him who thought a little bit differently about faith than he did. So they showed up in Galatia and they said, um, hey, we're here to make y'all Christians. And they said, we already are. You want to help us? They said, well, tell us what you know. They said, well, we learned everything from the apostle Paul. And Paul told us about Jesus' death, his resurrection, about why that matters, how that changes everything. He taught us how to live. We've all been baptized and we're living for Jesus now. The Jewish Christian missionaries said, okay. 
but are you following the law? Now remember, in Galatia, most of the people up in this region aren't Jewish. Most of them are Gentiles or non-Jews. So everything they ever learned about the Old Testament or everything they ever learned about, about the law was what they learned from Paul. And Paul had told them um, they were no longer bound by that law. But here come these Jewish Christian missionaries who mean well and who sound very persuasive that are telling them, no, 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 you have to follow the law. And the first thing you have to do, if you want to be a person who's part of the people of God, you've got to follow the law. And the first thing you've got to do, if you're a guy, you've got to be circumcised. That's the sign, that's the symbol of the covenant that the people of God have with God. And all of the guys in the group said, are you sure? I'm not sure about that. That's the major difference, right? Paul, on one hand, said, you just got to believe, have faith, and believe and be baptized as a symbol of your covenant with God and your covenant with the rest of us who are Jesus' followers. Where over here, his opponent said, no, no, uh, you have to uh, be baptized, yes, because that's what Jesus did, but you also need to follow the law because that's what Jesus did too. So circumcision is the symbol of the covenant for them. And that's why Paul kind of sounds like an annoyed parent as he writes to the Galatians. Um, in one of his more famous quotes in Scripture, uh, especially in, in Galatians, he kind of chastises them the way a good parent would. He says this, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You can kind of hear a parent, right? Like you, you can just see him texting this to, to some kid who bought a thousand pounds worth of dog food because his friends told him it would be funny, right? It, you, you can just say, who, who taught you to do that? What are you talking about? What do you mean? I recently read a, um, a new, an, an article that has a different translation of this. And because we, in, in the English language, we're pretty nice about it. We, we kind of gloss it over a little bit to make it nice. But the actual Greek rending, rendering of this, a closer translation, would probably read something like this. My dear idiots, who has tricked you? Who has tricked you? I love you, but that's kind of dumb. Well, it turns out it was missionaries. It was these missionaries, right? So Paul has to spend a lot of time in this letter reminding the Galatians who he is, what he's done, where he's come from, reminding them of his pedigree. Now, if you were to read Galatians completely out of context and you didn't know some of this stuff or you just read a few verses in there, you might not like Paul very much. You might not prefer him. In fact, I remember being in my 20s in uh, some Bible classes in college and in seminary just rolling my eyes because Paul can kind of come across a little bit arrogant if you don't know the context. But what he's doing is he's reminding them of who he is. All right, look, I am a very, very Jewish man, he says. And I uh, had a great education. And then I studied under this rabbi. And I was doing all sorts of things. I had an upper trajectory. And then I had an encounter with Christ. And Christ called me told me to go to you. I didn't get that from any other apostle. I got this from Jesus himself. All right? He goes on. He says, so I've been going around, and I'm the one who taught you all of this stuff. I'm the one who taught you everything. And now you're just going to abandon everything I said because they came in and talked to you? What are you talking about? Who tricked you? What do you mean? He spends a lot of time doing that. And then he goes on to remind the Galatian. The Galatians, look, because I'm so Jewish, because I know all of this stuff, because I study this stuff, and you didn't because you're not Jewish and you weren't raised in a house like mine and you didn't go to school with me, you may not know that circumcision is going to bind you to the law. And if you try to keep the law, you will never be righteous in God's eyes. If there was a law that we could keep to make us righteous, don't you think I would have kept it? Don't you think we would have all kept it? But it turns out there isn't one. We've never just been made righteous in God's eyes. The only thing that's going to make you righteous, Paul says, is faith in Jesus. Now, theoretically, theoretically, this could have been a very freeing thing for the Galatians. But many of them had, had kind of bought in to Paul's opponents, what, what they thought about stuff. Many of them, they, they'd given up on what Paul had said. They, they'd bought in freely. We actually have an image, uh, a picture, 
that survived from antiquity of the last Galatian Christian to get circumcised before Paul's letter arrived. And he said all this, and uh, here, here it is, actually. Yeah, he's a little bit upset about this sort of thing. But for Paul to run back to the law in order to earn grace, in order to become righteous before uh, God, was the same thing as choosing slavery over freedom. He says, look, it is faith alone that will make you righteous. We're going to follow. Th this is throughout Scripture, right? Paul points back to Abraham, like Father Abraham, the father of uh, the Jewish people, the one they all trace their lineage back to. He says, look, Abraham believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness, right? It wasn't that he did something. It was just that he had faith in what God had told him. And then he quotes Habakkuk, a prophet in Israel. The righteous will live by faith. The righteous live by faith. Paul says, look, let me give you an example. Say you were 12 years old and your parents owned an estate. They were wealthy and owned an estate. Servants, all kind of stuff everywhere. And they had to go away on a trip and they knew it was dangerous. So I said, all right, look, here's our will. Our will says, um, you're 12 years old now. Um, if something happens to us, you won't get it until you turn 18 because then you'll be able to really know how to do all of this stuff. You'll be an adult. You'll know how to administrate this place. But until then, you'll have a guardian and they will be in charge. They will be in charge of everything that happens here. And so they, they go away and the parents um, actually die on this dangerous journey. And now this heir the one who's supposed to inherit what's been promised to them is under the thumb of a guardian. The guardian is the one in control. The, the heir has no power. They may as well be another servant. And this is what Paul says. He says, so the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. So the law was our guardian. The law is the one in control, in charge, right? They're not the one that's been promised anything. They're just the one administrating everything. But it's only there until what? Until Christ came. And what's so big about when Christ came? What's so big about that? Because that's when the promise arrives. That's when what's been promised shows up. And what is that? Justification. Being made righteous in the eyes of God. God. And we look at the next verse, verse 25. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So Paul says we're, we're no longer under the law. The only thing that's changed here is Jesus came. The, the promise has come. Everything has been fulfilled. You're not under the law any longer. Why would you go running back to that? He has no idea why anybody would wantingly turn and return to the law. It's slavery in his mind. So to drive home his point, he tells the story of Abraham's two sons. You may know it, so bear with me if you do, but Abraham had a wife, and her name was Sarah. Abraham's wife, Sarah, was a little bit older, and so was Abraham, and they had never had children, and it really bothered the both of them, as it might you. One day Abraham's praying and God says, I'm going to give you descendants and they will be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. It was his faith that made him righteous in the eyes of God. That justified him in the eyes of God. Well, some time goes by and this child doesn't show up. So Abraham and his wife Sarah, trying to help God out, uh, they concoct a plan. See, it was normal in those days. It was kind of cultural custom in those days that if a, a master's wife hadn't had a child, that they could take a, a servant or, or a slave girl and they, and they could impregnate uh, this girl. And then when it came time for labor for this girl, she would sit on the lap of the master's wife while she uh, was in labor. So the idea was, this is where their version of surrogacy. So the idea was, uh, when the servant girl had a baby, that it was actually the master's wife's baby. 
So that's exactly what they did with their servant girl, Hagar. But as you might expect, Sarah never really liked the child who was born. In fact, she grew resentful and jealous and angry at Hagar. That's what happens sometimes when we try to do things in our own power. God promises something, and we just start trying to make it happen in our own power, in our own strength. We say, well, I'm, I'm going to help God out. But that's never what God wanted. So a few years goes by, and now Sarah is actually pregnant herself. And her baby's born. His name's Isaac. Don't you know that Hagar was now resentful and jealous and angry at Sarah and this child, Isaac, who'd done nothing. So Hagar and her son Ishmael had to leave because Isaac was the son of the promise. Isaac was the one who was ultimately going to be inheriting everything from Abraham. He was the one. And so Paul tells this story, reminds these Galatians of this story that many of them probably had never heard before. And he says, um, y'all, we are children of the promise. We are children of the promise. Uh, you're trying to go back to something in the flesh. You're trying to make this stuff happen on your own, to earn something from God on your own. You're trying to earn a promise of God and make it happen right now through the flesh, which is what they did with Hagar. He said, we are children of the promise. We are heirs. God has already given this to us. And all we have to do is believe and allow God to do that in our lives. And so directly after saying that, Paul says this, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. God promised us freedom in Christ. God promised us this inheritance. And so it's for freedom that Christ set us free, not so that we could turn back to some slavery, not so that we could turn back to something that's going to make our life more difficult than it has to be, not for any of that. It's for freedom. He goes on, stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Paul knows exactly what's coming if we cling to the law as the way we're going to become righteous, as the way we'll be justified before God. Now, listen, Paul's opponents meant very well. They absolutely meant well. Because from their perspective, they said, look, if we just start baptizing anybody who wants to be baptized, if we just start saying, hey, listen, uh, believe in Jesus and it's, it's all good, right, then... What's to stop them from living a life that isn't honoring to God? What's to stop them from living a life that's just lived with reckless abandon? That's sinful. Well, Paul understands that. But from Paul's perspective, he's saying, no, no. The other side of this is you'll be trying to, you'll think you can actually earn God's grace, but you can't. You'll, you'll do everything you can to earn God's grace, and you'll just be left feeling inadequate because you won't ultimately earn God's grace. The only way you earn God's grace is by believing that Jesus is his son and making Jesus king of your life. And so Paul addresses his opponent's perspective in verse 13. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Now remember, going back to Hagar and Ishmael and, and Sarah and Abraham, how that all kind of worked out. Don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Don't use your freedom to run back to slavery. Don't use your freedom to run back to these things where you're trying to make God do whatever you want. Don't use your freedom to try to help God out. Certainly don't use your freedom to go and live sinful lives because you can. Rather, he says, Serve one another humbly in love. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. I want you to catch this connection. Because when we have faith in Christ, that's the only thing that's going to set us free. That's the only thing that's going to justify us. So it sets us free. Um, but we don't use that freedom for sin. Instead, that freedom pushes us to love. So maybe the way we can sum it up here together is like this. Freedom leads us to love, and love leads us to serve. You ever think about it that way? 
the freedom that we have in Christ opens us up to love. Opens, up, opens us up to love in a way that maybe we've never uh, dared to love before. And that love will always lead us to service. One of the things I love most being about, uh, the, one of the things I love most about being a dad is I get to watch my girls. And my girls live with a pure innocence right now. They're at that great stage in life. They're not scared about tomorrow. They don't even think about it. They don't worry about that stuff. They just love people. My daughter Sawyer will talk your ear off if you let her, man. Because she'll walk up to anybody. People coming by on the street. It's 730 in the morning. We're, we're coming out and she'll just go, hi. And she'll strike up a conversation. Make your day better. She's not worried about anything. She lives in freedom. And that freedom allows her to love other people. And sometimes I find myself going, man, I want that. But as we get older, a lot of times we get real jaded, don't we? We get real jaded and think nobody, they're going to think I'm, I'm weird. They're going to think I'm crazy. Maybe they will. I don't know. They're going to think I'm strange. But I'll tell you what, watching Sawyer, watching Sloan just wave to strangers and talk at them. <laughs> There's something life-giving in it. There's something life-giving in it. And that freedom leads them to a place where they can love, man. But you're not going to find that freedom in dogma. You're not going to find that freedom in doctrines or anything like that. You're going to find it in faith in Jesus. And when you find that freedom in Jesus, you'll find that it opens you up to love other people that the rest of the world may tell you you shouldn't be loving, that the rest of the world would tell you you need to stay away from. See, that was the major problem that Paul had. The, the Jews had a, a large um, set of rules, 613 of them. And it put people into boxes, into categories, based on what they had done or had not done lately. Right? You can talk to that person. You cannot hang out with that person. You can be over here with that person. You cannot be over here with that person. And so when these Jewish Christian missionaries show up and start trying to bring people back to the law, Paul's saying, wait a second, wait a second. No, we all belong to each other now. We can hang out with whoever we want to. We can love whoever we want to because Jesus came so that uh, all could be brought near to God. He said, he said get, get, get that away from me. In Christ, there is neither male nor female, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. We're going to love whoever. And that love that we find ultimately will lead us to serve because we serve the people we love, don't we? You end up serving the people that you love and you do so day in and day out. It's the reason like with my, with my girls, like I'll get up in the middle of the night with, if I hear one of them screaming, I'm going to come running. If you've got a friend, you've got a friend, they call you at an inopportune time. It doesn't matter. You'll go help them. If they need your help, you'll go help them wherever they are. Why? Because you love them and you do anything for them. Love always leads us to serve. Love is rarely passive. And most often it is active and gets us going somewhere. That's why Paul brings it back to this verse. He says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because when you love them well, you're going to serve them well too. Now all that being said, all that being said, uh, I want to tell you how you can start serving others today, right now. Maybe I've convinced you and you're like, yes, I'm on board with that. Let me tell you how I think you can serve uh, real quick today. The first is uh, just look for ways to serve people uh, in your house or on your street today. Don't put it off. Look for ways you can serve. So maybe for you in your house, that means uh, going and cleaning up the living room before somebody else starts making snarky comments about it. Maybe it, it means uh, picking up uh, your shoes, just being a little more thoughtful or, or something like that, or finally finishing that project at your house that you've been working on or something like that. Uh, maybe it means uh, you're like my friend David Benefield who passed away uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, we were at his funeral and people kept saying, yeah, he used to always grab my trash cans and take them back up to my house every morning. I never asked him to do it. I didn't need him to do it. He just did it every week for like 20 years. That's what he did. That's who he was. Maybe you could serve somebody like that on your street. Something along those lines. Here's another way you can start serving today. Go to churchonthedrive.org. Go to our volunteer page. There's all kinds of ways you can serve. Here in the church, you can serve locally. You can serve globally. 
We've got all kind of options for you. Ooh, can I tell you, can we just real quick embarrass our tech team? Y'all take a look back if you're in the room. Look back at them. They're trying to hide. Yeah. Can we give them a round of applause? Just please. I want you to know something. And, and those of you online, I want you to know something. Every week they come in here to make this possible for you because they love you. Every week they come in here to serve because they love you. And they know that God is using church on the drive to reach people right now. And they want to be part of it. I'm so thankful for them. They're a great example of what it looks like to put love in action. That's, that's a way you can serve. Tech team, we got a coffee team that's, that's popped up. We got a welcome team. We got all sorts of stuff going on. Or maybe you just want to serve in our schools. Man, our schools need all the help, all the volunteers they can get. Why wouldn't you want to go volunteer over there? And there's some great kids, there's some great teachers. We got some great coaches who are part of our church. Yeah, uh, we, we love them, right? And, and it's a great time uh, to be in our community. Why not go and serve in our local schools? Why not go help in that way? You can go do flashcards with kids and VPK. You can do all sorts of things. You can go on a mission trip across the world too. We got people in Guatemala, Brazil, Africa, wherever. You get my point. There's ways for you to serve. And finally, you're like, look, I can't go anywhere. I can't do anything right now. I, I'm not, I don't have enough strength. Why don't you just write notes? Why don't you write some, some, some encouraging notes to somebody? Hey, thank you so much for this. Hey, I just want you to know I'm thinking about you and I'm praying for you. Who doesn't like getting a handwritten letter in the mail that says, I'm thinking about you and I'm praying for you, love you? It's a great place, great way to serve. Look, you were created for freedom. And that freedom will lead you to love, not fear. That, that freedom will lead you to love, not fear. That freedom will lead you to a place where you're not holding anything back. And that's my prayer for you, that you'll find that place. So as we go there, let, let's, let's pray together just for a moment. If you'll bow your head and close your eyes with me, I'm gonna, I just want to pray over you. Well, thank you for today. I thank you that you showed us what real service looks like. Thank you for loving us unconditionally. But thank you um, that you made a way for us. And all we have to do is believe. So I pray that for everyone listening to my voice today, that they would make the choice, make the decision, that they're just going to believe that you are who you say you are and that you are the king of their life. Lord, help us as a body of believers, help us as, a, as people um, to let the love that comes from knowing you drive us to serve other people. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Josh. Freedom in Jesus leads us to love. Love leads us to serve. If that's a message that is resonating with you, is kind of landing in your life, connect with the church. Um, Josh and the ministry team would love to have the chance to talk to you um, and, you know, maybe get coffee. Just kind of talk through what that next step may look like for you. And you can connect with the church by just texting the word NEXT, N-E-X-T, to the number 474747, 47 47, or going to the church's website, churchonthedrive.org, uh, slash NEXT. And if this is maybe your first time joining us online or here in person, it has been so good to... Um, worship with you today. And again, we would love to know that this was your first time. You might have some questions or may just, may just need some help that the church can help with. And again, you can connect with the church by just texting that number, um, the word next to that number. As Josh was saying, an action step that we can all take is to find a way to serve today at home, on our street, as neighbors, maybe as co-workers, um, in the office. It's been great to be with you. Hope you have a wonderful week. Remember that you are loved by the Creator God and you are loved by this church. Go in peace.